Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. And please check out getitinwriting.net forward slash shows for a full list of our podcasts and YouTube series. Welcome to Insights and Sound live from the NAM show floor. My guest is Michelle Moog Kusa, Executive Director of the Bob Moog Foundation. Welcome. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Let's give people a little bit of background for those of you, those of them who don't know what the Bob Moog Foundation is about. Should we start off with maybe just a little bit of the mission of the foundation? And then we'll get into its beginnings and um, how it all came about? Sure. Or is that backwards? Yes, that's, that's fine. The mission of the Bob Moog Foundation is to inspire people of all ages through the intersection of science, music, and innovation. Ooh, that's a lot of big words. <laughs> Very impressive. So tell us a little bit about the beginnings of the foundation. Well, the foundation really got its start after the family received an outpouring of gratitude and testimonials when my father passed away in 2005. My father was really humble about his work and um, he didn't talk about it that much. And so when he passed away and we got thousands of people from all over the world telling us how much he had inspired them, uh, we were inspired to, to take the power of his legacy and carry it forward to future generations to inspire them. So um, the beginnings I know were kind of, shall we say, humble? Yeah, so... Um, like you the, in your basement, basically? Yes, yes, <laughs> I, I'm trying to think where to start. Yeah, so... We were really kind of almost swept away by this outpouring of inspiration. My brother, Matthew, actually created the, the first um, iterations of the foundation. It wasn't even a nonprofit at that point. And as a family, we kind of had to regroup after my father passed away and figure out what we wanted the foundation to be about. Um, and I worked on that with a few of my family members and then eventually my family members decided this is not something that they wanted to pursue, uh, but I did. So I kind of stepped into the role eventually of executive director and I worked um, out of my basement for five years um, and the learning curve for nonprofit was approximately that steep, but I eventually figured it out and um, you know now we have a staff of eight people and we are no longer in my basement. Not even hardly. So let's fast forward a little bit because okay. you know there was a lot of fallow period there where you were, as you say, going through the learning curve and everything. Yes. During that period of time though, there were a lot of dreams. There were a lot of big dreams, many of which have been realized. A lot of it had to do with the archives. A lot of it had to do with educating young children. And a lot of it also had to do with finding a place to to create and call home, so to speak. So let's get into each of those in turn. Okay. Let's start off with Dr. Bob's Sound School. Dr. Bob's Sound School is one of our three Hallmark projects. It's our Hallmark educational project where we teach little kids, second graders to be exact, about the science of sound. Uh, we launched it about 10 years ago in eight classrooms in Asheville, North Carolina. It's a 10-week curriculum, so it's not just a flash in the pan, go, go in and do a presentation and leave. We, it's a 10-week curriculum. We train second grade teachers in our curriculum. It's a um, highly experiential and multi-sensory curriculum that um, basically walks kids through the fundamentals of the science of sound. So how sound is made, how it travels and how it's heard. And we've just had an incredible response um, to, from the teachers and the kids and even the administrators and the parents. And at this point, we have taught almost 25,000 second graders about the science of sound and 250 teachers as well. Wow. 
Yeah. It's pretty impressive. Now, let's also talk about the archives because you were, you sort of inherited, well, not sort of, you literally inherited pretty much a treasure trove of a lot of Bob's work. Tell me about that. So the Bob Moog Foundation Archive is a vast and growing collection of historical materials, um, all different kinds of materials ranging from instruments and prototypes to thousands of schematics, uh, photos, vintage catalogs, uh, desktop notes, uh, schematic notebooks, and the list just kind of goes on and on. And what's been really wonderful is we do have a kind of original base of that archive but we are considered a repository for historical documentation of that sort. So we get lots of people donating items to the archive, so the archive keeps on growing, which is really wonderful. We actually have some donated items, some keyboards here with us at NAM from the archive. Nice, nice. And that's, that's interesting that you have uh, really had a lot of people sort of come out of the woodwork and say, oh, I have, you know, I have, uh, this synthesizer model number three or serial number three or something like that and just kind of coming out of the, the woodwork and donating these things. Yeah, well I think in the end when people find they're not using an instrument as much as they used to, they really want to find a good home for it. They know it's, a, it's an incredibly built instrument and a very expressive instrument, so they want it to be somewhere where it will be used. And um, that is exactly what we do. You know, we, we accept the donations and then we restore the instruments. We share them in our Moogseum, which we'll talk about later. Yep. And for example, here at NAM and other places as well. So um, I think people entrust us to steward these very special historic materials. I know you've been sharing some of them with, uh, with other museums as well. Yes, with other museums, with researchers. There's a variety of, of, of ways that we, we share the Bob Moog Foundation archives. Okay. Now, yeah, let's get into the Moogseum. Because okay. that, I know, was a dream of yours for a long, long time and finally came to fruition just a couple of years ago. Yeah, so the Moogseum has been a vision since almost the inception of the organization, even when we were tiny and I was working out of my basement. You had we cool drawings back then, I remember seeing Yes. That. We were really, we really felt that having a facility that could inspire people the way that Bob did when he was alive, um, in a variety of ways, would be a very powerful way to carry his legacy forward. Of course, creating a Moogseum um, is easier said than done. And it did take us several years to be able to find an opportunity that was accessible to us. But we finally did that in 2019. And we opened the Moogseum in downtown Asheville in May of 2019. Um, you know, a few months later, we did have to close down because of the pandemic. And yeah, we were- we'll get into that in a minute. Yeah, we were closed for five months, but um, the Moogseum is, Every, everything that we dreamed it would be in that, it's uh, a facility that brings Bob's legacy alive to inspire people to think more creatively about the world around them. So we use Bob's legacy as a vehicle, really. Uh -huh. um, and we are just thrilled because we've had almost 18,000 people go through the Moogseum. It's somewhat of a smaller Moogseum. It's a storefront, essentially, like a a gallery museum. Um, we've had 18,000 people go through from all over the world and we have gotten accolades from Billboard Magazine, Fast Company, and many other online outlets who have visited and been really wowed by the fact that even though we have a modest sized space, we've packed in a lot of you information. Have, you have jammed a lot into a very small we, space. We have, yes. and it's all, every exhibit has, you know, its own unique characteristics, and it's meant to be accessible to people of all knowledge levels. So it's not um, geared specifically towards the synth geek. It's really geared towards anyone who wants to learn, who wants to be inspired, who's interested in history and culture and science and music and sound. Nice. So before we, uh, we're gonna circle back to the Moogseum in a moment, but I also wanna talk a little bit about the foundation itself. Okay. And 
how it's grown. I know that, uh, and full disclosure here, I am on the board of directors of the foundation. But let's talk about that a little bit because at one point, as you said, the foundation was pretty much you and your basement. And it eventually has grown into a really a, a fully functional nonprofit with not only a board of directors, but a really stellar board of advisors and a whole lot of friends. So let's talk a little bit about that, about the growth curve. Um, yeah, so I pretty much worked on my own for the first five years. The foundation did just turn 15. We're very proud of that. It's quite a big milestone for us. Um, so over the um, last 10 years or so, we've been able to slowly add staff. Uh, and now, as I mentioned before, we're up to about eight staff members. Um, which is really wonderful. We just um, brought on an assistant director, which is great. Someone who can manage the day-to-day -day operations of uh, the foundation uh, while I attend to some higher level projects that will help move the foundation forward. Um, we moved our offices into downtown. And as you noted, we were also able to expand our board of directors, which has been wonderful. We're now up to 10 people on the board of directors. And we created a board of advisors, 42 people strong uh, from all over the industry and outside of the industry. We're really trying to grow into education and science. Um, so we, we have this illustrious board of advisors, people who can help us with several aspects of our projects. And really, as you say, from all walks of not only the music industry, but education, science, I think that's a really important point because we're not just talking about people, we're not just talking about synth geeks. We're talking about science and education and really taking his legacy to a completely different level, which I think is what you've really been working to accomplish for quite a while now. Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the, um, the rough times that not only the Moogseum and the foundation, but everybody's been through for the last couple of years and tell me a little bit about how you guys coped with it, especially I know you were you had to close down the Mogzeem for quite a while, yeah. as did a lot of establishments. And yet, at this point, the foundation is actually healthier than before. So what kind of tips can you share with, uh, you know, how you guys made it through this? Well, um... Or maybe you don't want to share tips. No, no, know. no, it's okay, <laughs> it's okay, we did... You know, the, the, the pandemic really uh, took us by surprise as it did, as it did everybody. And it was a, a real challenge to shift and figure out what was gonna be healthiest for the organization. Unfortunately, you know, we, we closed the Moogseum on March 14th, never knowing when it was gonna open again. And, um, it, you know, during that time we were still paying for the Moogseum for quite some months after that, so that was a challenge. Um, but we also had to lay off our entire staff, except for me, so I ran the foundation by, by myself for four months. Just like old times. Yeah, just like old times, out of my basement even. See that? <laughs> um, yeah, and we, we wound up pivoting, you know, like so many other people, and offering a lot of our services online. We did a whole concert series online. We did educational things online. I did Moogseum tours online. You know, just trying to do everything that we could to pursue, continue to pursue our mission. Fortunately, during that time, we got a PPP loan and then a second PP loan. We got a couple of other grants from art institutions in North Carolina that were extremely helpful. Um, and then after uh, four months, we were able to bring our staff back. After five months, we were able to open the Moogseum again. Um, and fortunately, there were people there who st wanted to go through the Moogseum even though the pandemic was still, uh, you know, a, a concern. Um, and I think that everyone just had a reinvigorated energy to lift the foundation into this continued situation. So that's exactly what's happened. And we've been fortunate in that people also have had a renewed dedication to traveling. 
to getting out and trying to do new things, and that has helped the museum as well. Uh, it's helped Dr. Bob's Sound School in that the schools are, uh, you know, recommitted to offering innovative curricula to their to their children, especially after this weird period of, of remote learning. Oh, sure, especially, yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, we just, if there's one lesson that I learned from my father, I know that everyone in the world or lots of people in the world have lessons that they have learned from him and his legacy but my lesson from watching him my entire life was not to give up and that def that spirit definitely got me through the pandemic and the you know post pandemic period um, and it, it has paid off so we we have been able to come through it stronger than we went into it and that's also due to a lot of people supporting us and helping us get through that period. I can't stress how important it is to have supporters from all over the world helping us navigate that period and come through it even stronger so that we're able to provide even more of our work now than we were before. And you also have been pivoting with things like now, um, I know you've been taking the sound school online and coming up with a with a, uh, an ad adaptation of Dr. Bob's Sound School to be able to take that out into the world. Want to talk about that a little bit? Well, yeah, part of the pivoting that we did with Dr. Bob's Sound School is we created a virtual curriculum, which is really hard to do when you're taking this highly experiential curriculum that's based on kids playing instruments and doing all these hands-on experiments and all of a sudden making that virtual, but we did it. And we also had to pivot and make our teacher trainings virtual. Um, those were both separately very big endeavors, um, but so worth it. And we also created a series of four videos called At Home with Dr. Bob Song School. They're accessible to anybody um, that were essentially inspired by the material we teach in Dr. Bob Song School, but they were lessons for young children in the science of sound, very hands-on with materials that most people can find at home. So it's maybe for kids to do on their own or kids to do with their parents. So all of that lays the groundwork, as you kind of mentioned, to being able to eventually create more programming, educational programming online. We haven't quite gotten there yet because you know, we are a small organization with three large projects, but that is part of our goal in the next three to five years is to bring much more of our work online. Let's talk a little bit more about the other goals you guys have, because I know you've got some pretty big expansion goals in mind. Well, for Dr. Bob Sound School, right now it is based in Buncombe County and Asheville City Schools in, in Western North Carolina, which is where we're located. Uh, but we have always aspired to grow it regionally and nationwide. We've been working on that for a long time, and there are, you know, these things don't happen easily when you're a small organization with a limited budget. But we've been steadfast in working towards that goal, and we are extremely close. And our goal is really to grow Dr. Bob Sound School so it's serving at least 50,000 kids in the next five years. It's quite a lofty goal. It is a lofty goal, but, you know, this is what we aspire to. And then there's, you know, in addition to bringing it nationwide, is what we've mentioned before, is bringing more of the um, educational component online so that people all over the world can access it. And what about with the archives as well? Are you, are you, gonna, are you talking about putting some of that stuff online as well? Yeah, and we've actually started doing that. We've... Um, We've just recently been able to acquire archival software and have one of our staff member work part-time on um, starting to take all of our archive and digitize them so that we can more easily share them online with people all over the world, with researchers, um, and through our websites and probably help enhance the museum. So that is work that is underway. And you know, when we do get instruments donated to us and we restore them and we often put that kind of thing online. We do share some of the archives just in our normal day-to-day -day kind of blogging. Yeah, let's back up a little bit. What kind of materials are in these archives for people who don't know what, they're, what we're talking about here? So the archives are 
you know, our vast collection of uh, um, many different media, uh, prototypes and uh, all kinds of vintage instruments, tons of kind of uh, vintage catalogs that help tell the history of um, the Moog legacy. In addition to, we've got a collection of 2,500 schematics, which is absolutely amazing. We have desktop notebooks um, and uh, schematic notebooks. Um, there's correspondence, which is fascinating. And, and to be clear, this is largely stuff from like the 1970s and 80s when technology was a hell of a lot different. Yeah, and even from the 60s as well, and some of it's from sure, the 50s. Yeah. Because yeah. Bob started um, RA Moco in 1954. Wow. So we have some, you know, we have a, a Model 201 theremin from 1954 in the archives and in the Moxeum. This, you know, this is the dark ages to a lot of people. I mean, you know, it's a long, long time ago. I guess. This is the thing that I, I think a lot of people don't appreciate, is that there was no model. There was nothing for him to go by. This was completely, this was like, I need somebody to create something for me that doesn't exist yet. There's no, there's nothing to copy from. So I think, you know, the, when you talk about innovation, when you talk about critical thinking and being able to solve problems and stuff, that's where I think the legacy really does come out. And that's what I think that, that, that the foundation is trying to put out there for people to, to learn and to realize more than anything else is the fact that there, this really has to do with critical thinking and, and coming up with ideas that just didn't exist before. Bob was definitely a trailblazer. And you know, the fact is that in his initial work, he was responding to the needs of Herb Deutsch, who was an experimental jazz musician and professor at Hofstra University. Herb approached Bob and said, there are sounds for my compositions I want to make, and I'm not able to make them with the current technology. Do you think you could make me something? And Bob just said, yeah. So his first, his first mistake there was following a jazz musician. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I would classify it as a mistake, well, but. Well, you know, it depends how you feel about jazz, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but it really did lead to a lot of, I hate to use the terms like outside the box, but it really was, it was a lot of thinking, a lot of processing here that just didn't, there wasn't anything to go from. There wasn't a starting point in that sense. There wasn't, and I think it was a bold move both on Herb and Bob's part. And uh, you know, I know that there were a lot of trials and tribulations, and in in many different ways. But you know, as I said before, one thing I admire most about my father is his dedication, his commitment, and the fact that he never gave up, no matter how hard it was, because. He wanted to be able to help musicians expand the sonic universe with which they use to create music, this transcendental language that inspires so many people. I mean, I think he saw himself as part of this much larger ecosystem um, of, of people connecting through music. So he, he was, um, you know, rather fearless about pursuing things that had never been done before because of that. And that, I think, if there's one thing that we want to talk about in terms of the legacy that the foundation is trying to bring forward, it's not, you know, let's find the next inventor of the next big instrument or something like that. It's the idea of encouraging this kind of critical thinking, this kind of scientific methodology. These are the things that I think are not necessarily taught in schools that much anymore. The arts in general are not taught in schools that much anymore. And so what I think you guys are bringing forward is really more of a, a mode of thinking. And that's something that I think is more valuable than anything else right now in terms of the education that we have or lack these days in so many of our schools. Yeah, that that is absolutely right. and. You know, I, I say to people, Dr. Bob Sound School, yes, we teach sound. We teach the science of sound. We teach science. We want to get kids engaged in science. 
Uh, but the the real motivation is to get people to get kids engaged in the process of discovery. You know, as I said, every activity is multi-sensory, it's hands-on, and kids do, you, you talked about scientific methodology, we teach them about that. And every student um, has a science notebook, and they, they go by the same scientific methodology that Bob did. We use Bob's schematic notebook pages as examples for them. You always write down your ideas. No idea isn't worth writing down. And you test your idea. You write down your results and you figure out how to move forward. And I think one of the most valuable lessons we show them is a page from Bob's schematic notebooks where he wrote down his idea, he tested his idea, he wrote down the results, but then he crossed out, <laughs> he crossed it out and, and just said, didn't work. And then there's the next page where he tries again. Uh -huh. And we impress upon the students you got to try it. You keep trying. Every time you try, you're getting closer. And, you know, we, we want them to, to see the joy in that, to see the excitement in that. But beyond the process of discovery is creative thinking, thinking outside the box. And we get them doing that in the curriculum itself and with each other. There are certain exercises that are meant to spark discussion among second graders, and it's fascinating to listen to them. Oh, I bet. Yeah. yeah. So we do have a much bigger goal, and what ultimately we are trying to do is inspire and create the problem solvers of tomorrow. Which is so much different from basically teaching for the test, which is unfortunately where we, where a lot of education lives right now. Yeah, that's, we are, we have a very different approach, absolutely, <laughs> shall I say. Yeah, yeah. So let's, let's circle back to the Moogseum a little bit because I know you also, um, you've been doing some new stuff in the Moogseum lately. You want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. So um, we were able recently to expand the Moogseum just a little bit. It's a small space and we just had some, an office area in back of the gallery. So we have transformed that into a, a, an exhibit space. And we created a new exhibit called Patching Sound, which teaches people about modular synthesis, which is, of course, the, the original form of synthesis that, that Bob helped to bring to the world. Um, for people out there who don't know what that is, it's um, modular synthesizers are made up of different modules that have certain parameters of sound um, that, that can be controlled in different ways and then connected together to produce sounds. Think patch cables. Yes, patch cables. Uh, you know, some people say it looks like um, an old telephone operator's patch. Switchboard. Patch, yeah. Switchboard, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, so modular synthesis can be a little daunting for a lot of people because you look at the interface, which can be quite large, and you have no idea what's going on. Um, but it is a very fundamental, it's very fundamental to the world of synthesis. It's how synthesis got, got one of its starts. So um, a lot of the, the modern instruments are, you know, kind of the smaller versions of modular synthesis. It's evolved over the past 50 years. But we wanted to, to present this in a way that was accessible to anybody. And um, I, I do share with people that I'm... Uh, this is where my ignorance about synthesis comes in because my dad never, I never learned about synthesis as a kid. My dad wasn't really interested in teaching the kids about synthesis. He was, you know, more focused on working and just being with us as people, not as like prodigies or something of didn't want his, his work. I'm sorry? He didn't want his kids to be groupies? Uh, you know, he didn't want his kids to be groupies, definitely not. He just wanted us to do our own thing. He didn't, you know... And um, so I have learned a lot about synthesis in the past 15 years, but I'm still pretty much a layperson. So I have that perspective of what's gonna work. What do we need to do here to connect to people to make this complicated material simple so that they can really understand. So this cool exhibit, which is custom made by Reek Havoc of Sounds Amazing, um, which is a, an exhibit design firm, um, we came up with this whole console that looks like a small modular 
and there's a 15 minute presentation about, you know, that very clearly directs you put the yellow ca cable over by the yellow light into the other yellow light and you have that now, you know, connected your, your oscillator. And, um, you know, it explains what an oscillator is and then gives you the opportunity to explore the oscillator. And then you move on to the next component and so on and so on and so on. So when someone walks away, they have an idea about what modular synthesis is and they've actually patched a modular, which most people can't say that they've done. And, you know, hopefully they, they find it interesting and at least less daunting. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, oh, cool. So I want to circle back a little bit to the whole idea of how personal this is to you and what this has meant to you in terms of your own involvement in not only your father's legacy, but in terms of education. Talk to me a little bit about how this has been. I'm sure it's been really cathartic for you in so many ways o over a period of a lifetime here, you know, really, but especially in terms of how this has now, now that the foundation has been growing and really blossoming into its own organization, how has that been for you in terms of, not only on a personal level, but in making a mark, so to speak? Well, I, I, I'm sitting here grappling a little bit just <laughs> because uh, uh, with the whole personal part, and, and there is a personal part, but I, I have this kind of duality with, within which I function at, at the foundation because I feel very strongly, you know, people will say to me, this is so great what you're doing for your father. And that, that it's such a lovely thing to say, and I do I appreciate it. But in the back of my mind, I'm I'm thinking I I'm not doing this for my father. My father led a very complex life and a full life, and he made his mark on the world. Um, I am doing this for the future. And for future generations. Yes, and yeah. the fact is that for me, my father and Bob Moog are two separate people. I did not know Bob Moog until my father passed away. And I learned about Bob Moog because my father kept his career at arm's length from the family. I learned about Bob Moog from the world when they sent us all those testimonials that we talked about. So, you know, my, my personal commitment has been to the future and to take Bob Moog's legacy and do something meaningful and powerful with it. Um, it, it was such a powerful leg legacy. We just felt we, we couldn't let it just passively kind of sustain and decay, if you will. <laughs> I see what uh, you did there. Yes. So it's been very gratifying to, to see that we are not alone. We were not alone in our sense that this, this legacy deserved to be carried forward and was a powerful vehicle to, to inspire people, young and old, from all over the world, of all walks of life. That has been incredibly gratifying, the, the support we've gotten from people through the years in all of our ups and downs has been incredible and that has been extremely gratifying. I will say that if, if I was to reflect on the personal part of it for myself, it's that my father was gone a lot during my, when I was growing up. He was very busy. He was very focused on his work. He was somewhat of a workaholic. Uh, and um, he, was, he could be aloof in some ways in that he was in his head thinking about synthesis, trying to solve the next circuitry problem. <laughs> And as a kid, you kind of make that mean something about yourself. Sure, yeah. But as I learn more and more and more about his legacy, I, I, get, I understand. I have been able to understand him in that way. Um, have, you, have you become him? I have, I have, not, <laughs> I have not become him. Uh, and, and that has been really beautiful. Even times when I remember 
in the household, things being partic particularly stressful. And then I read about what professionally he was going through at that time, and I think, well, no wonder. No wonder, and actually, how did he even get through that with a young family of four kids and sure. being, you know, in debt and the company about to close, which happened in around 1970. So it, it, that has been a really beautiful aspect of it, that this work has helped me better understand my father. And I think probably in certain ways to better understand yourself as well, because it, I think it kind of defines your own mission, doesn't it? Well, in that, um, I would say, I don't, um, unfortunately, I don't think I inherited Bob Moog's big brains, but I did inherit his sense of persistence. Well, and yeah, yeah, uh, but I, what I'm going for here, what I'm getting at, I think, is also that you have, you have your own mission to fulfill. Aside from his own legacy, you have your own mission to fulfill in terms of education, in terms of creating an awareness, in terms of how you are impacting you, not just you personally, but the foundation, how you are impacting education in this modern world, you know, STEM, STEAM, all of those wonderful acronyms. And I think that is something that, that's a major contribution right there. And I think to be able to define that for yourself and for the foundation as this is our reason for being, this is what we're here to do, that's, that's pretty heavy too, I think. It, it is, it's, you know, it's been both daunting and empowering uh, and it's been wonderful to be able to watch it unfold. I mean, we are really committed to making a meaningful and important impact, um, as you say, on children's lives through education, on every visitor that comes through the Moogseum, on people who are accessing the Bob Moog Foundation archives and being inspired by the kind of history that they uncover and discover. So, yeah, it's, it's, um, it is definitely what motivates us to, to keep on going, to grow what we're doing and bring it to more people. We, we, um, we do sense a very large potential for this organization and we want to reach it for the reason of, you know, um, enriching people's lives. Mm -hmm. So what is next for the foundation? Well, first we have to make it through the NAM show. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> no, which has been really wonderful, actually. Absolutely oh, it's wonderful. Back, even, isn't it? even in the first few hours, it's been incredible. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Um, so, you know, if I were to sum it up, I would say what's next for the foundation is growth. We would like to grow Dr. Bob Sound School um, over the next five years to help inspire young children. Um, and we would like to take Dr. Bob Sound School and grow it to different grade levels so that we are actually tracking children as they, they go through school and continuing to build on their education in the way that we have in second grade. Um, we want to create a much bigger presence online for all three of our projects. You know, not, you know, not everyone is going to be able to attend Dr. Bob Song School. Not everyone is going to be able to visit the Moogseum. Not everyone is going to be able to see the archives in the Moogseum. So we want to be able to bring that online. And that is a huge project that will take us years and years to accomplish. But um, it is something that we are really committed to. And of course, um, you know, eventually, the Mo we envision the Moogseum growing into a, a much larger facility. Right now, it's about 1,500 square feet. Um, and we are hoping to grow it into something, you know, many times that size with performance spaces and research spaces and archival space. So we are, you know, slowly working towards that goal. So where can people find out more information? Um, they can find us at moogfoundation.org and also at moogseum.org. 
They can also find us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and YouTube. Ooh. Yes. Oh, that's right. That's yes. right. Cool. Okay. Any uh, any closing thoughts? Uh, well, um, sure. I always like to close with ways that people can support the Bob Moog Foundation. Um, you know, we talk about all these aspirations that we have for the organization. And, you know, it's not just for the organization. It's so that the organization can serve the greater good. Uh, our work is fueled by funding. Uh, so people can always donate at either one of our websites. Um, we have a membership program, a recurring donor program, um, one-time donations. All donations are greatly appreciated and really are critical to helping uh, move the foundation forward so that we can continue to inspire people and more people all over the world. Um, when we speak about the archive, if people have um, historical materials that they would like to donate to the Bob Moog Foundation archives, that is another very powerful way that we do our work. And as I said, here at NAM, it's just an example. We've already had probably 100 people come through our booth, play the vintage instruments that we um, fully restored and then brought here to share. Um, they have a keytar. <laughs> yes, we do have a, Mo a fully restored Moog Liberation keytar. Um, from the early 80s. It's it's actually cool. a really cool instrument. Yes, people are having a lot of fun with that. No kidding. Um, so we welcome a donation of materials of all kinds that just help us tell the story, whether it's the educational part, the science part, the music part. It's, it's you know, the, our reach is really multifaceted and quite extensive. Um, people can also volunteer um, eventually, we are going to be growing Dr. Bob's Sound School, so if there are teachers out there who are interested in exploring that program, they can write to us at info at moogfoundation.org. Um, and there are, there are other ways to help, such as we have an online store uh, where people can buy all kinds of cool Bob Moog Foundation merchandise. Every sale goes to benefit our, our projects for that. And, of course, um, visiting the Moogseum in downtown Asheville. It's a fun little place. It is a great, it's a great place. The staff there is absolutely wonderful and super helpful. And people get lost in that, in that Moogseum as far as in, lost in all of the information. It's true. It's true. There's really so much to see in such a small space. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, Michelle Moog Kusa, thank you for being my guest. Well, thank you for having me, and thanks for serving on the board of the Bob Moog Foundation for the past seven years. Oh, my God. Has it been that long? Yes. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.